a network engineer by pure chance, happens to notice a strange signal, an otherwise unremarkable pinging beacon originating from the US Office of Personnel Management, the OPM, and decides to investigate. What follows is the realization that the single greatest theft of government employee data has been going on for years, right under everyone's noses. In April of 2015, the US agency that manages the entire US government's civilian workforce was hacked. The US Office of Personnel Management, the OPM, discovered that millions of background checks containing extremely personal and sensitive information had been compromised. To compound the issue, a full set of fingerprint data were attached to each form, making services that require fingertip biometric authentication potentially insecure. You can easily change a compromised password. Good luck growing new fingerprints. There's a common misconception that cybersecurity should be focused solely on prevention. Trying to keep the attackers out is extremely important, but as history has shown us time and time again, the hackers are always going to find a way in. Mitigation and damage control often take a back seat to raw, unbridled hubris and underestimating your opponent, meaning anyone, even the mighty US government, can be caught with their pants down. <laughs> Over five years later, the how and why of the cyber attack remain hazy. The stolen data has remained relatively unused, and investigators have apparently yet to determine exactly why this treasure trove of data was stolen. It was initially unclear how such a security breach happened. Even years later now, the exact details are unconfirmed, but enough has been uncovered to piece together the story bit by bit, casting government officials in a less than favorable light. A group of hackers first breached OPM's defenses way back in November 2013. This initial attack, dubbed the X1 Group, seemed to be focused on putting out feelers to get an idea of how they could infiltrate the system, stay in there undetected, conduct what is known as an advanced persistent threat attack, and what sensitive data they could potentially steal. Though they couldn't access any of the personal records in this first attack, they did manage to smuggle out cybersecurity manuals as well as information about the architecture used by the IT department to both structure and protect the systems and data. The next month, the X1 group were back at it, this time able to work through the systems of two contractors, USIS and Keypoint, who had access to OPM's servers for the purposes of performing routine background checks of OPM employees. It wasn't until March of the following year, 2014, that OPM realized that they'd been compromised. They did not publicize the breach, rationalizing the decision by taking solace in the fact that the network that had been hacked did not actually contain any personal data. Brazenly, the choice was made to not act, but watch. The attackers were allowed continued access for the express purpose of surveillance. The OPM top brass had a plan though, the so-called Big Bang. It would come in the form of a complete system reset implemented in May of that very same year that would effectively purge the hackers from the system. So we have the Black Hats gaining access but unable to reach sensitive personal records. And they've been detected and are being watched before inevitably being punted from the server. What could possibly go wrong? Lots. In May, just weeks before the planned Big Bang, another group used login credentials stolen from Keypoint in an attack that was possibly linked to the first attack by X1. This new group was labeled X2 and used their access to the OPM network to burrow deep like a parasite, installing malware while they were in there to create a backdoor for near unlimited and undetectable access to the OPM network. At this point, OPM was blissfully unaware that two separate entities had snuck past them. Late May, and the Big Bang system reset has been performed, removing X1 as planned. Unfortunately, unbeknownst to OPM, X2 could still use their installed backdoor to regain access. OPM thought the job was done. They gave themselves a collective pat on the back and a stern handshake and marveled at their excellent executed plan. All was well. Right? It was during July and August of 2014 when the first of the highly sensitive background investigation data was pilfered from OPM databases. 
As the months rolled on, the attacks grew more and more brazen. A few months later, in December, 4.2 million separate personnel files were stolen. In late March of 2015, X2 learned how to access the fingerprint data that matched the files they had already taken. By this stage, the breach was a gaping hole, with a torrential flood of data being exfiltrated from within. With such a monumental volume of personnel details spewing out of the OPM servers, it was only a matter of time before the inevitable happened and they were found. So as the saying goes, make hay while the sun shines. April 2015, and finally someone takes notice. OPM network engineer Brendan Salisbury was working in the Security Operations Center five days before SciTech services were due to perform a demo of their Cypher tool on the system. It was initially misreported that SciTech were the ones who detected the malware and breach, but in reality, they just confirmed what the team already knew. Salisbury's team noticed malware signaling out like a beacon, contacting a command and control server from two different OPM servers. To reiterate, it's still unknown exactly how X1 first gained access to OPM networks. It's also unclear whether X1 and X2 were working together, or just loosely affiliated in a relationship where they mutually shared some information. The first mistake was poor cybersecurity practices in place leading up to X1's infiltration. The second mistake was not heeding the wake-up call once X1 had been detected. The Big Bang plan was sound, but did not account for the possibility that another party X2 had already installed a backdoor. Simple two-factor authentication would very likely have thwarted the hacker's plans. Stealing a valid username and password becomes useless when a user is required to also authenticate by, say, ownership with something like an RSA ID key, and or authenticate by characteristic with, say, a biometric system. Without multi-factor authentication, a group like X2 could steal login credentials, usernames and passwords, and easily use them to sign in like nothing was wrong just like they did through Keypoint. OPM implemented a two-factor authentication system in January of 2015, well after X2 had become entrenched in the network. Once X2 were in, they ran an Active Directory privilege escalation attack to obtain root access. And once you have root access to Active Directory in most organizations, it's game over. The Local Security Subsystem Authority Service, or LSASS, saves a user's login credentials after they log into a server or a PC. On a 2008 or earlier Windows server, the LSASS writes all the user credentials in the same memory address. X2 used a program called MimiCats to specifically exploit this vulnerability and return a memory dump of all users' credentials once they had logged into the server. Essentially, after gaining initial access to one of OPM's servers, all X2 had to do was wait until an OPM admin had logged in to steal their username and password. Newer Windows systems do not share passwords in plain text inside the domain controller. Instead, they use Windows NT LAN Manager, NTLM. The X2 group used a pass the hash attack to exploit a vulnerability in the NTLM authentication protocol. From there, root privileges enabled X2 to install a remote access trojan, or a backdoor, communicating over HTTP to an external malicious network, the creatively named opmsecurity.org. The malicious software that was installed by the hackers was renamed mcutil.dll in order to mimic McAfee's software. The personnel files could now be read and exfiltrated virtually undetected. What's interesting is the mcutil.dll file name is what originally caught Salisbury's eye. At a glance, it was just a run-of-the-mill antivirus file from McAfee, something that wouldn't seem out of the ordinary, except for the fact that the OPM didn't use McAfee software. Because it stood out so blatantly, it was clear this was malware. OPM had to quickly scramble to stop the second wave of attackers that was the X2 group. They called on the US government's US CERT emergency team to help identify the weaknesses in the OPM systems that had made the attack possible in the first place. SciTech and SciLance were the security software vendors called upon for additional assistance. In fact, SciTechs were just days from installing a demo of their software on OPM servers. It turns out 
that Silence had recommended one of their higher-end Protect products to OPM, though it was rejected for inconsistent and conflicting reasons. After the X2 attack was discovered, the Silence 5 program was installed on OPM systems, and it effectively detected the communications between the Backdoor Trojan and the fake opmsecurity.org offsite server. Ironically, a free trial version of the previously dismissed Protect software was installed and lit up like a Christmas tree once it began scanning diagnostics for the forensic server images, so it totally would have found this attack if it had been installed sooner. Another fun fact, OPM continued to use this trial version extensively for over three months before eventually opting for a paid subscription on the very last day of their trial. By the time SciTech arrived five days after Salisbury had discovered the breach, it was still not made public, and the news had not been shared with SciTech. As expected, the SciTech demonstration uncovered the breach, which led to many assuming that SciTech had in fact uncovered the sinister plot. Another not-so-fun fact, SciTech were commissioned to help cleanse the infected systems, with OPM racking up more than $800,000 worth of bills before refusing to sign a contract or pay the cybersecurity company. OPM only budgeted $7 million a year for cybersecurity, which was amongst the lowest across all U.S. government agencies. It is well worth spending a little bit in the short term to save a huge amount of headache in the long term. Though the Big Bang plan was devised as a means of wiping X1 from the systems once they'd been found out, OPM did downplay the breach. X1 were attempting to install keyloggers onto the system's database to steal more access, which flagged the system. Instead of stopping and taking stock of the affected areas of the network, OPM opted to put on their favorite spy outfit and try to catch the hackers themselves. Two-factor authentication should have been in place years before these cyber attacks took place. Something as simple as a one-time password app installed on users' work phones would likely have prevented X2 from ever getting into the OPM servers with the stolen login credentials. Username and passwords aren't enough anymore. Breach after breach occurs because of the easy-to-guess passwords or easy-to-steal login credentials. These attacks can usually be stopped dead in their tracks by using proper multi-factor authentication. Giving third parties unlimited administrative access to your network systems is a huge mistake. In this case, USIS and Keypoint were the weakest links. And it was Keypoint that eventually provided the means for X2 to burrow into the network. The hackers weren't without a sense of humor. The fake domain name they used, opmsecurity.org, and other fake domains they used were registered to Steve Rogers and Tony Stark, good old Captain America and Iron Man. The extent of the hack meant over 14 million people were either directly or indirectly impacted by the breach. With no one to point the finger at, the overwhelming consensus was state-sponsored attackers within the Chinese government, who notoriously used superhero names as a cheeky calling card. It's probably a fair assumption it was the Chinese government, as Chinese national Yu Pin Gang was arrested by the FBI in August 2017 after being caught trying to install the remote access tool Sakula. This software is relatively unused and was the same software that provided the backdoor for the OPM hack. If you found this video interesting and informative, then you can hit the thumbs up button. And if you want to be notified when we release additional videos in this series, then please subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notifications. Let us know in the comments below what breaches you want us to cover in future videos. See you in the next one.